Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go uh, uh, ahead and introduce myself. I'm Kevin Moore, uh, and I'm an Extension Associate for Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Oklahoma State University. And uh, we are working with the City of Edmond in order to try to help uh, provide some education materials to the city on um, outdoor water conservation topics. And uh, so today we're gonna be talking about uh, irrigation checkup program. And uh, this is something that uh, is, is good for anyone with an irrigation system to be engaged in, uh, just to help make sure that your system is working properly and uh, that you're not gonna be having any problems with the efficiency of your system. Uh, want to introduce Think Water. Think Water is the uh, organization uh, that sort of spearheads these water conservation uh, programs that we have with a number of different communities across the state. Uh, we've been working in particular with the um, City of Edmond, as I mentioned before, as well as the City of Oklahoma City. Uh, we're also partner with the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. And our goal is just to try to get the, the message of uh, sustainable use of uh, irrigation, landscape practices, in order to preserve our, our water resources. Um, you know, right now it's it's one of those times where we're getting some rain, uh, but we know that Oklahoma goes through these sorts of cycles of drought and, and rain, and uh, we want to be educating the public on how to use these resources as effectively as possible uh, so that we're prepared for whatever nature throws at us. So uh, just a couple of quick uh, quiz questions here. Our, our typical water, or water consumption in uh, the city of Edmond during the winter time is about 8 million gallons a day. Uh, any thoughts on how high it can get in the summer? Maybe triple that. Triple that? No, that's, that's a pretty good guess, really. So uh, the, the peak consumption in the summer can get up to about 26 million gallons per day. And so that swing, that variability is a challenge for uh, the water resources department to, to make sure that they can provide enough water uh, that's needed in the summertime. Uh, also, you know, people see that impact on their water bills, and that's often one of the things that gets people thinking a little bit more about uh, their water use and outdoor water use in particular. Uh, so on average, about how much water do you think that an individual uses each day in Oklahoma? Uh, maybe 80. 80 gallons? 80 gallons a day. That, that would seem like a pretty uh, reasonable amount of water. It's actually higher than that about 885 gallons per person per day. Now, that's an average over a year, um, but uh, that, that is a fairly common uh, sort of level of water consumption that we see. And um, there is definitely that influence also of the higher usage rates in the summer. So a few things about water. 70% um, of the earth, you might remember from your uh, science class in, in middle school, about 70% of the earth is covered in water, uh, but only 2.5% of this is fresh water. Uh, and 1% of that fresh water is surface water, uh, easily accessible. About 30% of that is, uh, is groundwater. And 69% uh, of that uh, groundwater, or not groundwater, that fresh water is uh, captured in glaciers and ice caps. So we have a, a pretty limited amount of water that we're using for our, our drinking water and, and the water that we're accessing on a regular basis. Uh, you and I, we're all about 60% water and we need water to survive. We're, uh, we need about two to three liters of water each day uh, in order to survive, and we get that from the things that we eat and drink. Uh, but as you know, you can't survive more than a few days without water. And uh, so water is precious to us. We want to make sure that we uh, continue to have the water that we need in order to, uh, uh, to grow and thrive as a community and uh, make sure that we can meet the needs of, of uh, Edmund in the future. So as I mentioned, lately we've seen uh, more of these sort of sites. Uh, we've had a lot of flooding lately. We've had some heavy rains this year. Uh, but we also remember uh, just a few years ago uh, when Lake Hefner uh, was looking very dry. And uh, this difference that we have between the picture on the left, which is about 2013, and the picture on the right in 2015 when the uh, big drought that we had uh, was broken, we can see how much the, the uh, water that we have available in Oklahoma, how that can change. And so if we look at our precipitation history uh, within Oklahoma, uh, you'll see each of, these, uh, each of these black dots that we have here is a 
um, an amount of precipitation that we had for a particular year. Our average is generally uh, about 34 inches of, of rainfall that we would see in a year. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of variability uh, within those figures. And if you look over time at averages, um, these are uh, sort of five-year uh, trends that are shown within the graph. You can see we'll have periods of, um, of more rain than average and periods of less rain than, than would be average. So the, the green bars are these wetter periods. Uh, the brown bars are these uh, are these drier periods, and so we're in a little bit of a wetter period right now. Uh, but we know that the the next drought can be just around the corner. When we talk about uh, water consumption mentioned earlier, in the winter months in the city of Edmond, typically about eight million gallons a day, up to as high as 26 million gallons a day. And the population of Edmond has been growing considerably in the last 20 years. Uh, so we've seen about a 35% increase in the population of Edmond. So we're pushing about 92,000 people in the city now. And this change uh, has, has required a lot of investment in the uh, infrastructure of the city. Uh, so there's uh, a large uh, number of projects going on right now to meet these water and wastewater infrastructure demands for the city, uh, currently investing over $400 million within infrastructure projects. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, and so I'd like to invite Josh Campbell to come up now. And uh, he's going to speak specifically about uh, the topic that we have uh, today, which is related to uh, our irrigation uh, checkup program and uh, how you can go about checking your irrigation system to make sure it's operating at peak uh, efficiency. So I hand it over to you, Josh. So today I'm going to talk, like Dr. Moore said, a little bit about the home irrigation system checkup process. And that is just, in a nutshell, a simple uh, three-step process that we've outlined for how to help homeowners go about monitoring on a seasonal or yearly basis their home irrigation systems in order to identify issues and, and ultimately save water. And also, July happens to be Smart Irrigation Month, and that is a national campaign um, of the Irrigation Association, a nationwide, actually a worldwide irrigation association that um, links folks from the agricultural industry, the, the landscape industry, um, all of that come together um, and, and they issue um, educational offerings and they, they promote um, smart irrigation during the month of July. And smart irrigation is really about thinking about technology, thinking about um, efficiency, thinking about best practices when you, when you manage water and irrigation. And so we'll talk more about that, um, but I just wanted to emphasize the um, Smart Irrigation Month as we get started. So just a quick recap on, on what Dr. Moore was sharing with us. Outdoor water use, now we're looking kind of a, as, a, as a whole across the United States, um, makes up between 30 to 40 percent of household usage. And in the summertime, it really peaks uh, to as much as 50 percent or higher in some places. The thing that I find most shocking is that about 50 percent of all household water usage, and this is, this is information from the EPA, um, so EPA statistics, they, they say that 50 percent of all household water usage is lost due to wind evaporation and runoff. So inefficiency in our home sprinkler systems, our home water use leads to about half of the water that we use outside being wasted. And so if you do the math, if we're using about half of our ho total household water usage outdoors in the summer months and half of that is wasted, then we're essentially wasting about a quarter of our total household water usage. Um, and to put that in perspective, watering an average size lawn 20 minutes a day for a week is the equivalent to running your shower nonstop for about four days. Again, Smart Irrigation Month is an initiative of the Irrigation Association, and it is bringing the economic, environmental, and uh, efficient irrigation technology concepts and products and services to the forefront and promoting those. It's all about healthy landscapes and efficient water use. Here in the Oklahoma City Metro, we now have a population of 
1.2, maybe, maybe higher, 1.3 million people, and, and it continues to grow all the time. And over the past few decades, there's been an immense growth in home sprinkler systems. It didn't used to be common practice for builders to put in a sprinkler system with every new build home, um, but that is the case now. And so every time a home is built, a new sprinkler goes in. And when, when someone buys a home or uh, builds a new home, oftentimes there's very little, if any, information and education provided to the homeowner on how to manage that irrigation system, what to do with the scheduling and things like that. So it's, it's really upon the homeowner to manage that and, and make um, the decisions that they need to, to make to manage their irrigation systems efficiently. Again, peak demand, so the, the summertime demand can stress municipal supplies. So not only is conservation you know, an efficiency and a dollars and cents issues, but it's a supply issue as well. As populations grow, as demand increases on systems, then the need for conservation becomes more important. Also, we have a mostly unregulated industry here in Oklahoma in that there isn't a lot of enforcement on design um, or on installation quality. And so, not to say that there aren't good folks in the industry, but it is, um, it can be a challenge for homeowners to, to make sure that the systems that they have in place are functioning properly and are efficiently designed for their needs. So I say all this to really just emphasize that we need to be focusing more and more on efficient irrigation in our landscapes. And this is a, a graphic that kind of highlights or illustrates what a, what's going on in a typical home irrigation system. You can see the, the city main water supply comes into the, the property, you've got a water meter, backflow preventer, which prevents water that comes out from the city supply into the home supply from going back into the city supply. So that's a safety mechanism. Then you've got all these lateral lines that go out to different parts of the landscape and they feed water to your landscape. Those are called individual zones. And most home landscapes might have anywhere from four to, to 10 or 12 zones that they are managing to get irrigation across their entire property. And the types of irrigation equipment that you'll see in a home landscape are gonna be most often one of these three types of irrigation heads um, or, or irrigation components. So most commonly we see spray heads. Those are, those are heads that pop up from the ground and spray in a fixed pattern. Um, and those will be used in shrub beds, flower beds, and small turf areas, areas that are under 15 feet. And they tend to put out about one to one and a half inches of precipitation for every one hour that they're running. Rotors, on the other hand, they, they're called rotors because they move. They rotate through the landscape. They're the ones that are they're gonna be used in larger turf areas. And although they throw a further distance and they're used to cover larger turf areas, they actually have um, generally a lower precipitation rate, which means that a typical rotor is gonna put out somewhere between three quarters of an inch to one inch of water for every one hour of, rain, uh, of run time. So sometimes that, that could equate to as much as half the volume that you would see with a spray head. And so it's really important that we understand how these are used in our landscapes, the appropriate places to use them. Uh, certainly, unless we have precipitation rates from these two types of heads that are matched, then we don't want to mix them in the landscape because there's going to be different volumes and uh, rates of water flowing through them. And then drip irrigation most often is seen in landscape flower beds, um, areas that are really hard to irrigate with the traditional pop-up spray heads. Maybe you have established shrubs or established plantings. So drip irrigation is watering right there at the base of the plants, usually under a mulch cover, and it's gonna be applying water at a much, much slower rate. So whereas you're measuring water from the sprays and rotors in inches per hour, drip irrigation is measured in gallons per hour. As a rule of thumb, the drip irrigation is gonna be most efficient in the way that it uses water in the landscape and sprays are gonna be the least efficient. Now, if I had to sum up the, the two biggest mistakes that I see homeowners make with their irrigation systems, I would say number one is that we're watering when we don't need to be watering. So this, this idea that just because we are on an odd even watering schedule that we have to water every, 
every odd or even day based on our schedule is um, is really a mistake and it's I under I understand it we don't want to miss our watering day we we'd rather err on the side of using water than not using it but it leads to immense amounts of overuse of water and especially if our systems aren't operating efficiently then this can be um, an area that can lead to uh, all sorts of over water use and really what it comes down to is to, to get this in check is really proper scheduling of your irrigation controller using controllers that are efficient that are up to date so they they offer odd, odd even watering options maybe they offer the ability for you to um, control them from your smartphone or they take in real-time information from a weather station so that if there's rainfall or if um, you know if the the soil moisture is above a certain threshold they can make automatic um, modifications to the schedule those are types of things that can be done um, to rein in over water use and watering when you don't need to be watering. Also understanding the needs of the plants in your landscape is really important. Established plants, perennial plants, are gonna need far less water than annuals and newly planted plants and really can go extended periods of two weeks to a month with very little, if any, rainfall. Um, and so just, just understanding the needs of your landscape and really erring on the side of um, letting your irrigation system water your landscape deeply but not so much frequently is probably the biggest mistake that I see homeowners make. Number two, I think, is lack of maintenance. I think that it's really easy for us to go about our lives. We, we have the irrigation system set to run early in the morning. Either we're not up or we're getting ready for the day. And so we just don't see the irrigation system in operation very often. And when we do, maybe we're seeing one zone here, one zone there, but we're not seeing the entirety of the system at one time. And what that does is it allows problems that happen in the, um, in the landscape, irrigation heads that break, uh, things that leaks and things that crop up over time um, th that are just part of normal maintenance. It allows those to go unnoticed for sometimes a long time and that can lead to uh, immense water waste and a, and a need for major repairs. And so I recommend, and something that we'll talk about here in just a moment, is a seasonal or, or a, at least a yearly visual inspection of your irrigation system as a homeowner. Just kick on the system, walk through it, takes a few minutes, and just I, get your eyes on the components that are irrigating your landscape and see if you can see anything that might be causing problems. And we call this a simple irrigation system checkup. And really it's just a process for identifying problems, inefficiencies in your home irrigation system. And it's a, it's a way to develop improvements and repairs. And so it's, it's basically helps you get a visual of what's going on and then develop a plan for those improvements. If you wanna do your own sprinkler system checkup, you wanna spend about two to three minutes for every zone. So let's say you have 10 zones, you're gonna be spending about 20 to 30 minutes as a homeowner to do this. And then we recommend flagging. You can pick up flags at a local hardware store for pretty cheap or you can just make a note on a notepad of where the issue is. And that allows you to come back and come right to the problem and, and be able to address it. You wanna troubleshoot areas that might be too wet or dry. That could be um, perhaps a, a head that's not, not having water come out or one head that has more water coming out than another. Uh, it could be all sorts of issues. So those are things to look for. Uh, you, you'll be straightening and aligning rotors and spray heads that might be spraying the driveway or the sidewalk. Sometimes you'll see heads that are sunken in the ground. They can be elevated up. You might see clogged nozzles, broken heads. Sometimes the battery in our controllers is the issue. Uh, a lot of times it'll be plugged into the wall in the garage, but sometimes power goes out, or if we don't have it plugged in and it's operating on a battery pack, the battery needs to be replaced every six months or so. Simple issues can sometimes be problems in our landscape. We do have a fact sheet that can be accessed on our fact sheet website, just osufacts.okstate.edu. And this just walks you simply through what I just outlined for you, how to go about starting with your sprinkler controller, walking through and doing a home irrigation system checkup. What it looks like is step one, you as, as the homeowner are gonna walk to your controller. Sometimes it's outside, sometimes it's in the garage. Wherever it is, you should know where it is and you should know how to access it turn it on, so, so make sure you're familiar with your irrigation controller. What you're gonna to wanna to do here, step one, is to just kind of 
look through what your existing watering schedule is. A lot of times that can be the first clue to what might be going on. And I, I'll tell you, I've seen people that thought that they had an irrigation schedule that was watering a zone for nine minutes and they accidentally had it running for nine hours and, or 90 minutes. And so those things can be easy mistakes to make and if we don't pay attention can lead to a lot of issues. So really what you're doing here is you're looking at your controller, you're looking at what your current settings are, you're ensuring that that's what you want in place. Do you want to be watering um, on the days of the week that you show your watering? Do you wanna be watering your zones for the length of time that you show your watering? Is your controller showing any error signs? Those are things you look for at this point. You record that and then we'll you can always come back later and, and make the modifications after you get a visual of what your landscape is doing and what the needs are. That's when you would come back to your controller and maybe make any changes. At that point, almost every home irrigation controller has an option to test all zones. You can do a, a run all zones or a test all zone cycle and you can set the length or the, the number of minutes that that test will go through each zone. So typically three minutes is enough time for the average home uh, landscape to, to walk through each zone and, and record what you see. If you have a larger yard, you might go up to four or five minutes. If you have a really small yard, maybe two minutes is sufficient. But that gives you enough time to follow each zone as the, the irrigation system turns it on, make your notes, visually look at each head as you're going through. And so you can see here in this picture, uh, this homeowner we're working with, we, we're discussing a, a head in his uh, side yard in the turf that has failed to pop up and so it's just basically creating a puddle there underneath the turf because that head hasn't popped up so we're just discussing with him that issue we flagged it we've made a note and we know that's something that we'll come back to and we'll address as we go to to fix these problems so as you walk through the landscape you've identified the problems you know step three is is really making a record of those so um, like I said, we identified the problem, we're making a note, you can flag it, and then in that fact sheet, there's actually a, a, a chart there, uh, a page where you can record issues yourself. There's nothing fancy about that other than it's, it's a, a nice, easy, convenient way to, to walk you through the checkup. You can take a simple notepad from home, um, write zone one, you know, some description of where it is, and so that you can come back and that note matches whatever flag that you've put in the landscape. When you're flagging heads, you're making it really easy to come back and uh, find the problem that you've spotted in the landscape. Sometimes we may have 10, 15, 20 heads in a certain zone, and so if we don't take care to, to flag it and then make a note, sometimes we can lose track of what we're actually, um, what we notice as the issue. Some of the things you might see as you go through, uh, things like busted heads or heads that have have popped up uh, or popped off and so we've just got a geyser. A lot of times this stuff like this happens as a result of a lawnmower or weed eater hitting the head. Maybe it didn't fully retract like it should have or we're mowing low enough that we're able to hit it. Sometimes if a, a vehicle goes up over the curb, it can crush or damage heads. And so these kind of things are things that happen uh, very often, especially in areas right alongside streets and, and uh, curbs. And so things to watch for this head has been compromised and um, compromised to the point that the water no longer comes out in a spray pattern like it should, but it, it's just a geyser. So what's probably happened here is that the nozzle itself has popped off or um, it's been busted open to the point where water is just escaping like a geyser. Uh, sometimes we'll see heads that are maybe poorly spaced and this is maybe a design issue or uh, some, you as a homeowner or somebody previously tried to make a repair and you see all sorts of odd things. These two heads are you know, maybe four to six inches apart and they're spraying right into these landscape plants, really damaging them. And so um, as, as plants grow up and they mature in the landscape beds, sometimes the needs of, of the design and the way we irrigate the beds is gonna change as well. And so that, uh, this bed would be a good candidate or a good option for thinking about maybe converting over to drip irrigation or lowering uh, or elevating these heads so you can get down either beneath or above the, the plant canopy. Um, 
thinking about ways to address this issue will be important. Because what you see here, not only are you putting out a ton of water here, so the distribution of water across this entire bed is gonna be uneven, but because these plants are in the way, a lot of the water is just bouncing right back off in, in the form of runoff onto the street and is being wasted. Again, so heads not properly matched to the landscape. This rotor over time has, has become too much for this area of turf because the shrub was put here. And also I believe, if I remember right, this rotor wasn't actually turning. So it was just one solid stream hammering this shrub. You'll see stuff like that all the time that um, really are simple things to address, but you wouldn't know if you're not paying attention and you're not watching for those things. Sometimes over time we have, um, as a result of high pressure or maybe just aged equipment, seals and things will leak or maybe the, the head cap has come kind of loose. And so it causes uh, the head to either not have enough pressure to pop up or it's clogged with dirt and debris. And so it, it lead, leads to some ponding um, and water accumulation right there at the base, which is going to be a big problem in terms of uniformity of water distribution. It might cause a real soggy, muddy, uh, damp spot right there. So things like that are things that we see common in the landscape. Um, sometimes we see big issues like this where the the water is all coming out of the base here really rapidly. So the, the seal or something, um, you know, is causing a major leak, which is allowing water to just pond right here and, and flow off onto hardscapes. High pressure also is a really big issue that we see. So you see here that all this misting, this cloud, that's a typically a good visual indication of high pressure in a home irrigation system. When you have really high pressure, it turns those water droplets coming out of the spray heads so small that they, they basically volatize, they, they drift off in the wind, they become like mist and they, they, what I call back billowing. You'll see it when the irrigation system is running, they just kind of become these little cloud forms and, and blow off in the wind. And that's a good visual sign that you might have high pressure. Another thing is, you know, the, those, those misty clouds on a good sunny day will form nice rainbows. And that is another thing you'll often see with really intense high pressure. You'll also hear a, a hissing sound, a real loud hissing sound. So those are just some visual indications of high pressure. I and mean, you can see, I don't even have to tell you why high pressure is bad because you can see here as you look at the, the hardscape, the concrete on the street here, all the, the wet that you see here that's all water that was intended for the flower bed that's ended up on the concrete. So what happens as, as that uh, pressure increases, it increases the, uh, or decreases the efficiency of application. And so you have water that, that drifts in the wind or, or blows away uh, onto hardscapes and doesn't get where it's intended. So I've got a, just a visual example here of a pressure gauge this is something that you as a homeowner can pick up um, or you can you know, certainly find a, find a way to, to borrow one of these and you can get a reading of what your pressure is if you wanna have an exact idea of what your pressure is in, in the head, you know, at, at the rotor or at the spray head. You can also get a general idea of what your pressure is to, to your entire landscape at one of the hose bibs or something like that around the house. For spray heads, you generally want to operate at 30 PSI. That's where they are most efficient and that's where they're designed and intended to operate. As in pressure increases, your efficiency and the amount of water you're consuming actually uh, increases as well. You start getting up into the 60 PSI range, which is very common here in Edmond, then your, your efficiency takes a nosedive and, and you really are losing immense amount of, of water uh, in proportion to what, you, to what you're tr actually getting to the landscape. So, so it's definitely something to, to think about when you start getting elevated PSIs that high for spray heads. And I didn't mention it, but rotors are gonna operate best around 45 PSI. They can tolerate a little bit higher threshold of, of pressure um, than a spray head can. However, even even as you start getting into 60 PSI and greater on rotors, you, you definitely start to, to see some significant efficiency reduction.
Just to recap on some of the, the problems you might see as you're looking at uh, your home landscape system, uh, irrigation system, you might see high water pressure, which we'll talk more about here in just a minute, but is, is really um, a, a big factor in reducing irrigation efficiency. And, and it could be a result of bad design or uh, a number of factors. Low water pressure is sometimes seen, but it's, it's not as common as high pressure. Usually low water pressure is gonna be the result of maybe a pipe leak or break or bust. It could be a design issue as well where you have too many heads on a single zone and, and so not enough water pressure to, um, to fully operate all of those heads at one time. Rotors, pop-up sprays, and drip mixed in the same zone is something I see a lot. And again, the reason that's a problem is they all have different precipitation rates. So they're all using water and putting water out at different rates and also they have different pressure requirements. And so you're gonna have all sorts of uniformity and, and um, uneven water application issues when you mix rotor sprays, drip, all in the same zone. Probably the most common thing you see is sprinklers spraying street and hardscapes. Sometimes the simple answer is that the rotor or the spray head is just misaligned and that's, that's probably most common. Um, you know, just needing to be adjusted so that it's spraying the intended turf area or flower bed area rather than the street. However, sometimes it's more complicated than that. As I showed you earlier, high pressure is a significant contributor to, to water runoff and onto hardscapes because it carries that from the, the uh, landscape area where it was intended to land out onto um, the sidewalk or the street or the driveway or what, whatever. Broken heads, again, things that get hit by lawnmowers, cars, clogged or missing nozzles. Sometimes, especially if we have an area where there's not uh, turf or mulch, as that head pops up and down out of the ground, bits of uh, soil and debris can get into the nozzles and can clog them. And sometimes if a head is not, uh, not spraying, it's as simple as just cleaning some dirt and soil out of the head or replacing the nozzle. Big, big contributors to water waste are controller run times that are far too long. If you think about the soil type of, of your home landscape, if you've got a really heavy clay soil, those particles are so small that they can only take in or infiltrate water at a, a certain rate. Whereas the sandier your soil is, the faster that water will infiltrate. And so understanding the soil type that you have in your landscape will help you make decisions about how long your run times will be. If you've got a very heavy clay soil, maybe your run times can only be five to 10 minutes before you start to see ponding and runoff, and you might have to chop your irrigation schedule up. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit as well. Also, uh, probably an extremely common issue is just watering on the wrong schedule. Odd even watering is not necessarily a, a direct conservation measure, but it's, it's more of a demand issue. But when you are watering on the wrong uh, days of the week, one, you're, you're probably watering more than you need to be and um, you're, you're also contributing to the demand pressure that is costing the city of Edmond a lot of money to address. We can help you water your landscape effectively and efficiently while still doing it, meeting the ordinances that the city has in place. Some examples here in Edmond. So as, as we've done irrigation checkups across the city of Edmond over the past year or so, we've taken measurements of pressure at most of the homes and we've seen an average pressure of about 50 to 60 PSI, which is certainly not, as an average, certainly not the highest we've seen. I've seen pressures, as you can see in this picture, that top out my gauge. When, when you compare it to that, it's not, it doesn't sound like a crazy number to go from 30 to 50 PSI or 30 to 60 PSI, but the loss in efficiency for every pound of pressure that you go above the, the designed operating pressure, you exponentially lose efficiency. And we'll show you what I mean by that in just a minute. Uh, here in Oklahoma City and in, in Edmond Metro, uh, we have measured pressures up to 96 PSI at some homes. And then I, this picture, my gauge topped out. Um, the average pressure is about 58 PSI as a whole for the, for the metro area that we've seen. And again, the optimum pressure for sprays is gonna be about 30 PSI and for rotors is about 45 PSI. So here's what I mean. When you, you lose efficiency because of misting, fogging, it's susceptible to wind and drift. This simple little graph here shows you that as the pressure increases, so you know here we're down at 20 PSI and up here is 60 PSI, as the pressure increases, so pressure is increasing, we are also seeing an increase in the flow. 
So not only are you losing efficiency as your pressure increases, um, but you're actually using and consuming more water while doing that. And here's an example of that visually. So this picture here on your left is 30 PSI, and this is the intended coverage that we wanted. So, you know, we, we did a pretty good job of getting water distributed evenly across this area. Uh, at 50 PSI, you can see that the coverage has been drastically reduced, you know, so the efficiency of, of the water getting to where we wanted it is, is not there. At the same time, we're using 1.5 gallons per minute more at each head while doing that. So, so we've, we've probably cut by, a, cut by two thirds or at least a half the efficiency of the, the water application. You can see there all this dry concrete area versus over here at 30 PSI, we've got the entire target area covered pretty much and we've used less water in doing so. So how do you address that as homeowners? The, the easiest way, in, unless you have uh, just significant issues that, that we don't have time to talk about today, the easiest way is to use more efficient products. Things like uh, pressure uh, reducing spray heads, and so pressure regulating spray heads. And these are available in, for both rotors and sprays, and most every major manufacturer and brand offers products. And what it does is it reduces your, your pressure down to the intended or the target pressure. When you look for spray heads, what you're looking for are things that say, um, you know, Pro Spray or PRS, PRX, that PR that you see on these heads of different brands gives, gives you uh, the indication that that is a pressure reducing or pressure regulating spray body. So an example of the efficiency savings, so now we're talking more about uh, gallons and dollars that you can see. So at 50 PSI, again in that example, we were using 4.8 gallons per minute at every single head that we were operating. At 30 PSI, 3.3 gallons per minute at every single head. So that's a, that's a difference of 1.5 gallons per minute per head that we were seeing a reduction. And if you take that and extrapolate it out to a 20 minute runtime, and you're, you're doing that, um, let's say on an odd even schedule or every other day, so maybe 15 days a month, at one, at one head, you're saving 450 gallons per head. That's the equivalent of 26 showers worth of water per spray head per month. So if you have 10, um, 10 or 15 spray heads in a single zone, you do the math at how much water you could save and reduce by simply making, uh, addressing issues like this in your landscape a priority. So we'll play a quick little game. I've got a few uh, problems that I want our audience to help me identify and see if we can find a solution. So this is, our problem is we've got uh, heavy clay soil or compacted soil. We're running our irrigation system and very quickly it leads to, to runoff because the soil just can't, simply cannot infiltrate the water quick enough. So what is a solution we could use to address this issue in our landscape? Reduce the run time. Reduce the run time? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. So we could reduce the run time or do what's called a cycle and soak where we, we take, uh, let's say maybe we have a, an intended run time of 20 minutes for this zone and maybe we chop it up into two 10 minute run times that are spread apart by 30 minutes or an hour or um, every few days. So that's exactly right. We can, we can actually uh, set our controller to reduce the run time to shorter periods so that we maximize the amount of water that is infiltrating into the soil. All right, here's another problem for you. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to address this after what we just talked about. You've got high pressure. So what it's doing is it's taking your, your spray your water spray and it's just basically shredding it to bits and, and throwing it uh, into the wind. What's, what's the solution for this problem? Uh, put the, uh, uh, get the pressure down by using the, uh, the pressure caps or what you call the... Uh, yep, that's water. exactly right. So we can address the pressure in each head by using pressure regulating spray heads or rotors and 
uh, and or addressing it at the individual zone valves if we need to. All right, here's my final problem and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll move on. We didn't talk about this, so this one's kind of a, a, I guess, a pop quiz. But if your irrigation system happens to just kick on in the rain, which should, should never happen, uh, what, what's the solution to this? Yep. Yeah, so the comment was having using some sort of um, uh, rain gauge or soil moisture sensor, some sort of piece of technology to aid in this. And that's exactly right. What, what you would do in this situation, you have a couple options. You can install a very inexpensive uh, wired or wireless rain-free sensor. Uh, and what that does is it, when, as soon as it detects rainfall or moisture, um, it, it delays your irrigation system or shuts it off for a period of time, usually 48 hours. And so that's a, a great way to prevent, and an ex inexpensive way as well, to prevent your controller from allowing irrigation to occur during rainfall. And uh, these things are very inexpensive, under, under $20, $30 to, to purchase and have installed, and can, can really significantly save you uh, the headache of having your irrigation system applying water during the rain. And, um, not to mention the water waste that occurs when you're irrigating in the rain, but the, the physical consequences to your landscape um, can be huge. We've all experienced the last few months of intense rainfall, and some of us have experienced erosion issues, turf washing away, and all sorts of headache issues that, that come as a result of too much water in the landscape. And so uh, not only is applying water efficiently going to, to save us money on our water bill, but it's going to really help us have better performance and results and look and appeal to our, to our turf areas or our landscape beds. And um, specifically in the hot summer months like we see now, when, we're, when we reduce the, um, the amount of irrigation or over irrigation, we can, we can have a lot of um, control or reduce the susceptibility of our turf areas to diseases, especially if you've got tall fescue in your landscape and you're, uh, you're irrigating very regularly in hot, humid conditions, the, the fungal disease, the brown patch issues will, will spike. And so irrigation has a direct relationship to disease in our landscape as well. well another thing I wanted to point out here is this is, this is stuff that we'll address in more, more in depth at our next class, which is July 18th. I'll be talking specifically about Smart Irrigation Month and how it pertains to irrigation technology. So there's a lot of new efficient uh, controllers, sensors, and things that can help automate very cost-effective ways to automate irrigation in our landscape so that it takes a lot of the, the uh, struggle and concern and, and um, headache of managing out of our hands to the point that it's automated in an efficient way. It's receiving real-time information from a weather station, um, perhaps it's receiving information from a sensor, and it can help us be more efficient with how we manage our system. But an efficient system with all the bells and whistles, all the gadgets, is only as good as the, the bones of the system. So if you have a, a poor design, you have a lot of issues, it, heads and things that are broken, leaking, um, those have to be addressed first before you try to, to use technology to maximize the efficiency in your landscape. And so that's why we talked about this first. So to recap, as much as 50% of outdoor water use is lost due to inefficient watering practices. And if you remember, I told you at the beginning, in the summer, as much as 50% of all household water use goes outside. So if we are losing 50% due to inefficient watering practices, then essentially one quarter or a fourth of all the water that we use during the summer months is, is likely to be wasted. So take your water bill and you know, do the math on what one fourth of that is and that's what you, you could be wasting every month in terms of dollars and cents. Um, Smart Irrigation Month, which is the reason we're, we're highlighting um, these two topics in July, is an initiative to promote efficient irrigation and it's, a, it's really a worldwide initiative. And in fact, both City of Oklahoma City, City of Edmond, in the past have made proclamations that um, July is Smart Irrigation Month. So as a city, your city is standing behind this, um, this concept of, of efficient irrigation practices. 
The biggest mistakes I, I believe homeowners make in managing their irrigation systems is this addiction to an every other day watering schedule or watering more than we need. And then a lack of consistent, regular uh, attention being paid to the irrigation system for repairs. So conducting a once a year visual checkup like we just walked you through will help you see your irrigation system operating and it'll help you identify problems that are leading to potentially a lot of waste that you maybe didn't even know was occurring. And then it gives you a plan for how to address that. You know now what, what uh, needs you have and so then you can try to address some of that in repairing it yourself or take that to a contractor to work with and get those issues addressed. Um, that's all I have for today, so I'll, I'll take some questions if we have any questions from the audience. Thank you.